Oh, you know what I didn't check? If there are any spoilers in this script, I'll, let me scroll through it real quick. Why don't you just give a spoiler warning regardless? I know that I have to give a spoiler warning, but I do also have to check and see if there's something I'm actually spoiling or if I'm just doing it to commit to the bit because at this point my life has just oh, spiraled out just of control. Oh, committing to a bit? I'm, you're not actually going insane? I'm committing to a bit which is making me go insane. It is, it is the most meta thing possible because I was being insane because that was funny, but then I've had to increasingly get in insane over every single video, which has made me actually lose my mind. And at this point, who is the character and who is the person? Who is Jay Martin? Who is Jay, if not just a conception of jokes at his expense, which has gone too far and he's become something that is just like an eldritch deity of unknown self-deprecating humor. Fish. <laughs> Spoiler warning. Away. <laughs>yeah okay great that works that works for spoiler warning that's that's sure sure i am not in the right mind space to record but boy are we doing it all right so today i wanted to talk about a concept which is very integral to the ttrpg space as a whole and it's really not difficult to figure out why that is but i wanted to dive into it deeper because i think it is a really fascinating concept that we all take for granted because it's always been there and that is the concept of the adventuring party a small group of individuals with powerful skills on their own but together they are powerful enough to face down whatever it is that they're going to go against a dragon an evil warlord the actual concept of time and space oh i know lots of things lots of things or maybe just a really lucky kobold that keeps rolling natural 20s and you guys keep rolling natural ones. Point is, the adventuring party is something that we expect in every game that we play. So why is that? What does it do? I mean, obviously we can come up with the very easy answers as to why it exists, what led to that existing, and I will get into that. But then I wanna talk about something more. What does it do? What does it accomplish? Is it better to not have an adventuring party? Because I think it's a concept that is all too often forgotten and just considered to be the norm. But should it be? And is there more to it? So be it. You shall be the Fellowship of the Ring. Right. Where are we going? Now, this leads into the question of what is a party typically? Is it just a group of individuals? Is it just a bunch of people who happen to travel together? What actually does it make? Well, the adventuring party is actually something that is very common down to the most basic and old of folklore and myths. You could take anything from all the way back in the time, and as long as there is a large journey, a group of people are typically created to go on that journey and provide their different skills to overcome obstacles. You could see this in things such as Journey to the West, or, you know, your typical Lord of the Rings. An adventuring party is a group of people who all come together with different skills in order to overcome a specific task, typically, anyways. Now, the real reason this exists in old folklore is because it was easier to create a large group of characters to tell a story because then you could keep people entertained. Most of those stories were told over word of mouth, and in order to keep people enraptured in the story that you were telling, you had to introduce new characters so that there would be a new thing to encounter and explain and get excited for. But when it comes to more recent stories, the adventuring party is sort of an offshoot of that that continues to be created because of the fact that, well, more characters typically leads to more dynamics. More people interacting with each other allows you to see a more outside world. Take Lord of the Rings, for example. Primarily, the story goes through the process of seeing the viewpoint of Frodo. And Frodo is somebody who is very new to the world. He's never really left the Shire. He doesn't know what's out there. And so the rest of the party is typically there to contrast Frodo and give him a different perspective. It allows him to see the different parts of the world. Gimli allows him to see Dwarven culture. Legolas allows him to see Elven culture. Gandalf allows him to see the things that humans do that he may not typically know, as well as the magical side of the world. Pure light. A wizard is never late, Frodo Baggins. Nor is he early. 
He arrives precisely when he means to. These characters exist to add contrast. Meanwhile, you have the different hobbits that are with him, Merry, Pippin, and Sam, which then give a contrast to the different ways that hobbits could see things differently than Frodo. Characters add new portions of the world. And in a TTRPG, yeah, this is pretty obvious. Most of the times when a party is created, what it means is that everybody's going to give their backstory and that's going to develop a part of the world. And then when they all get together, they all have different viewpoints on what the world is. Do they believe the gods are evil? Do they believe that patriarchy is evil? Do they believe that the very government existing is evil? The point is they're all probably going to have different points of views and those things are going to conflict, contrast, and add more interesting dynamics within the story. More characters adds more intrigue. Usually. The problem is, and this shouldn't be a surprise, too many characters leads to too many dynamics. And this can begin to get muddled because if you have too many people there, they all become tropes rather than actual characters. All right, what's your gimmick? Gimmick? Yeah, like the last guys. They were all misfit minions and crap. What are you? We're just here for your planet. Though if I had to choose, I'd say I'm the pretty one. Eh, six out of ten. You sassy bitch. That makes you the weird one with the freaky power. I can spawn mini-me's! Spectacular. And that would make you, no doubt, the big, tough, stupid one. You take that back or I'll kill you! All right, all right, you're not tough. That's better! Wait, didn't you- Give him a minute. And honestly, if Lord of the Rings wasn't as long as it was, it would probably fall under that margin because there are so many characters within it. You have Boromir, Aragorn, Gandalf, Legolas, Gimli, Sam, Pippin, Frodo, and that's just some of the basic concepts, not in all of the characters that they meet along the way. And so if it wasn't that long, they probably couldn't flesh out those characters. So yeah, uh, having too many can be difficult, which leads to the concept of a party specifically in TTRPGs. When we think about it in TTRPGs, it usually consists of four to five people, kind of. Uh, the honest truth is, is that can change a lot based on how many friends you have, how many people are wanting to play, and if you have enough people. You could just do one person, or two, or three, but four or five, well, usually three or four, honestly, is what most games are balanced around because it is the easiest amount of people to get at a table. It's also a very balanced number when telling a story so that nobody gets, well, overplayed by the rest of the characters or sort of thrown under the bus because everybody else is playing and you just don't have enough time to. And it's also just a very fun number, to be honest. It's so fun to see all that happen. However, uh, that number is very flexible. Take a show like Critical Role, where they typically have six, seven, sometimes eight people at the table. Me uh, yeah, Vex is behind you, Percy's kind of to the front and the right of you. Pike's above you. Is Pike within, like, inspiring range? Or, oh wait, actually, be, yeah. Which, honestly, I consider to be too much. If they weren't all professional actors and knowing how to actually make sure that they are not overshadowing the table and know when to take a step back, I think that would be a very boring game for them. Many of them are there just to watch the rest of them play, and that's fine. But imagine if you didn't have a bunch of professional actors at the table to watch play. Would it be that interesting? What if you just had Gary from down the street and Alyssa from further down the street, just kind of sitting and shooting the crap at the table. I mean, it might be a little entertaining, but it's not gonna be as entertaining as a bunch of professional actors playing D&D. And so if they just do that the whole session and you don't get to do anything, that's not that entertaining. So actual plays like that really shouldn't be used as an example for what a party should look like. Yes, they're incredible, do not get me wrong. And trying to emulate their skills is basically akin to trying to see somebody who's very good at their craft, like uh, LeBron James. LeBron James, LeBron James, LeBron James, LeBron James, LeBron James. And trying to mimic how he plays basketball. That's a good thing to do, but you can't compare yourself to them and you can't expect your own game to be the same as theirs. And you need to accept that and understand that. And this goes even further into the entire topic, would you consider that most TTRPGs have archetypes? In D&D, we call these classes, of course, and you know, your lineage, but most TTRPGs have systems like this. Systems where you get to choose specific skills from a specific archetype that nobody else is going to have unless they choose that archetype. This allows for even more dynamics within the party and it makes it much more interesting when you have a group of four to five people all with those different archetypes because you then get to see the differences 
as well as in combat. Let's be honest, most systems have combat at the center of them, and combat lives and dies off of the differences of what you guys can do in battle. A fighter can take down very specific enemies and tank a large chunk of damage by themselves. Meanwhile, a barbarian can do very similar things, but can typically be a little bit more reckless, no pun intended, and charge in to take more of the brunt of what the fighter could, adding a sort of supportive role as well as dealing a decent amount of damage. Meanwhile, you have your spellcasters, which can sit up on the back and cast fireball on the fighter and the barbarian, because that's helpful, somehow. I don't know how, but you know, every combat could do better with a fireball, apparently. I have a fourth level slot! <laughs> yes, I am adding you. No. Yeah, no, I am adding you. Fireball's a good spell. Mm-hmm. It is a good spell. It deals a lot of damage, especially when you drop it on your allies. Well, maybe they shouldn't be in my way. Point proof. <laughs> Listen, I got to use it on that stupid clown from Baldur's, and I didn't hit any of my allies. Dribbles a clown? Yeah, mm -hmm. I hit dribbles with it. You did? I... Honestly, I'm still trying to figure out how you didn't kill anybody in the crowd nor hit any of the allies with that fireball. It, it, it took way too much work. It was mainly because I didn't want to hear you get on to <laughs> So me getting on to you is accomplishing something. I'll keep doing it. I'm going to do it to, get, to like make you get on to me and then it won't work and then you'll stop because you'll give up and then I'll just get to do whatever I want. It's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> And you can also have a cleric supporting. The point is, each of the archetypes do different things like drop fireball on the party. Each of them do different things and that is where combat lives and dies. An adventuring party is meant to add variety, dynamics, etc. And yes, everything that I've said has probably been really obvious and not that interesting. That's not why I want to talk about this today. I want to talk about the narrative implications of an adventuring party. Because let's look at this realistically, okay? You have a group of people who are just deciding to take on the world's threats, who are trying to get, probably at the beginning of the campaign, if you're to go by most campaign standards, get a little bit of gold, accomplish some goals, but by the end, you're fighting a massive threat, and yes, you each have your individual reasons for doing it, but why is this small group of people doing this? What's that about? In a real world scenario, it wouldn't be a small group of people. It'd be like an army. Uh, you'd send the king's army after the giant dragon. And yeah, maybe they can accomplish it, but the fact that a small group of people could do the things that they do in these stories realistically doesn't make a lot of sense. So why do we do that? Why do we commit to that concept so hard and refuse to let it go? Well, we could go back to the beginning of D&D &D and understand that D&D &D originally was a war game and it was created with this concept of what if the armies were just individuals with actual backstories. That's how D&D was created, that very concept. So yeah, of course you're gonna have like four or five people. That, that's how the game started. But the game has evolved since then. The hobby of TTRPGs has evolved since then, but the adventuring party has stayed an important concept. Yes, sometimes you might swap in and out of characters, but most of the heart of any game that I've played in or seen in the past five years has been the fact that each of these characters grows a bond with each other. The adventuring party has become crucial to most storytelling that I've seen in this narrative, especially when it comes to actual plays, because as we all know, I'm the actual play guy. I'm the live play guy. I'm the guy who watches them and reviews them and spends too much of his life watching them. Really though, like too much. Too of much of my life. Just too much. I'm not stopping though. Listen to an audiobook at some point in your life. I can't make videos on audiobook. I mean, I guess I could, but I really feel like that you know, this is part of my job at this point. <laughs> Everyone in the comments, go tell Jay to listen to The Fourth Wing. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> if the top comment is a comment about somebody telling me to, to watch or read, listen to The Fourth Wing, and it has more than 200 votes, I'll say yes. That's a really steep challenge. It is a steep challenge. <laughs> the point is, the adventuring party has been a very crucial part of this storytelling of any of the stories that I've seen told in TTRPGs. And it's not surprising as to why. The people at the table want to connect with each other. They want to tell those stories. They want to feel like the story they are telling has heart, has meaning. And that's a good thing. That is powerful, it is important, and I think that it is why this hobby is so important to so many people. See, when people play these games, we play to be the heroes. Not a surprising comment at all, I'm sure. But when we play to be the hero, it's not because we want to feel self-important, it's because we want to feel like we can make a difference. Like the actions that we take 
make a change. And especially in today's world, that's an important feeling to have because today's world feels like nothing we do matters. And I've mentioned this in about three videos in a row at this point, which shouldn't be surprising that this has been on my mind because the world hasn't stopped being scary. Honestly, it's been scary for a long time, but it's like it's been put in a spotlight recently. And playing these games is a form of escapism, but I feel like it's more than just escapism. It's giving you a reason to believe that you can do these things. The idea of going up against a god in a fictional world is great, but it also allows us to, in our real lives, sit there and look at the god of our terrifying relationships with others and face them, the god of our terrifying jobs and face them, to feel like we can actually face the challenges in our lives. But I've begun to wonder recently, is that realistic? Like, yes, it allows us to face those challenges, but does it really change anything? Are we actually accomplishing anything in our lives by doing that? Or are we just continuing to push through the mundanity of day-to-day -day life? And the answer that I found was actually within a, a Matthew Colville video. Hi everybody, my name is Matt Colville, and as you can see, I am a white, middle-class, middle-aged nerd. And if you guessed, I bet that guy plays D&D, you would be correct. This is my channel, and it's about running Dungeons & Dragons. Here's the picture. For those of you guys who don't know, Matthew Colville is a huge inspiration to my channel. And most of the times when I have a topic I want to talk about, I actually go see if Matt has a video on it so that I can go watch it. And truthfully, it's not so that I can mimic his thoughts. I disagree with him about 60% of the time, but I disagree with him in a way that makes me think more. And I don't think it's because he's wrong. I think we have a very strong, different way of disagreeing. But this was one of the few times that he said something that I just felt hit me like a truck. At the end of one of his videos, he was discussing the concept of adventuring parties. And he said, Many people ask, can a small, dedicated group of people change the world? To which I respond, it's the only thing that ever has. This hobby is something that is important to many people because it allows us to feel like we have an excuse to spend time with friends. It allows us to feel like we have an excuse to push away the mundanity of the world and experience something else when the world is constantly telling us that it is all we should experience is the mundanity. But more so than that, it reminds us that caring with a group of people and wanting to make a change in the world isn't just important, it's necessary, and it does matter. And that is so important to remember. There are so few things in the world today that remind us that finding something that connects us is important. And a world where social media is changing so frequently, language is changing so frequently, the news is changing so frequently, we no longer have a common ground to stand on. There's no such thing as popular culture. There's no such thing as finding something that we agree with. Instead, the only thing we can focus on is the things that are different between us. And in some ways, that's encouraging. Focusing on the differences between us allows us to accept those differences, but at the same time, it makes us feel isolated. Like those differences are the only thing that matters, that we have nothing in common with each other. And hobbies like this are important. They allow us to feel like we have something in common with each other, that there is a reason to connect that we can make a change because a small, dedicated group of people cares enough. Earlier, my wife mentioned reading a book. That is something that I could connect with her over. And it's so easy for me to immediately see the difference between that, to see the differences between us. She likes to read, I like to watch live plays, but the truth is, is we both like to read stories. We both like to experience that. We both like to connect over that. And honestly, that is one of the things that me and her connect over, is that we both love watching a good movie or reading a good book and experiencing the emotional highs and lows of that together and discussing what we liked about it and what we didn't. Which, yeah, I probably will go read that book, by the way. I gotta be so emotional. I'm not ready for this. <laughs> walk in, trying to have a good old time. Trying and to have a good old cry. time. <laughs> I always want to cry when I'm on camera. It's, just, it's my brain. <laughs> Why does it need to be your brand? I don't know. <laughs> Point is, there is a lot about this hobby, about storytelling that inspires humans. That's why we've told stories 
all over the course of history. It's why we've always told stories of a small group of people rising up and making a change because it is possible, it does happen, and it's worth caring about. So the next time you're at your table, look around at that group of people and know that it's okay to care and think that you can make a change because you can, because it's the only thing that ever has. That the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And never let anybody tell you that a small group of dedicated people can't change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. Until next time, peace.